right, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the conference today. It's, a, it's going to be in English. All right, so what I want to do is introduce today's speaker, who is Chad Book. Um, he's a 2016 graduate of the University of the Philippines com in computer science. Uh, he's a teacher slash volunteer at, uh, at Al Kadev, a uh, school built and managed by the Lumad indigenous community in the Southern Philippines. Uh, he's a human rights activist and environmental advocate. And he is also the spokesperson for the Save Our Schools Network. And so the, his conference today, his talk today is the Lumad struggle. And it's a discussion about the issues facing the Lumad indigenous community. So welcome, Chad. Hello. Good after, uh, good evening. Uh, it's actually evening here in the Philippines, and good morning for everyone there in Kiona. Is that Kiona? <laughs> so thank you for having me here. Uh, it's really an honor for us to share our experiences uh, about the Lumad struggle. No. So will I be starting my presentation now? Yes. Okay. So my talk will be about. Uh, the Lumad Laban or the struggle of the Lumad indigenous peoples in southern Philippines for their ancestral lands, education, and human rights. Although I may not be a uh, indigenous people myself, indigenous person, uh, I have worked with the Lumad indigenous people for uh, already four years now. So uh, my presentation will tackle about the experiences of the Lumad people that I have been working with. So first off, uh, we'd have to situate where for first, where's the Philippines. So if we are in Canada, we are in the uh, eastern side of the Pacific Ocean. So for the Philippines, we are in the western side of the Pacific Ocean. No? just below China, South Korea, and Japan. And the Lumad people, basically, uh, they are the indigenous peoples of Southern Philippines. So uh, Lumad people are living in Mindanao, all over Mindanao. So here, although there are a lot of indigenous peoples in the Philippines, Lumad people is the term for the indigenous people in Southern Philippines. And uh, I will talk about Karaga region as a specific example, since I am working with the indigenous people of Karaga region. So Karaga region, uh, it is known as the mining capital of the Philippines because uh, 25 out of the 50 metallic mines in the Philippines are operating in Karaga region. So uh, Karaga region is really rich you know, with mineral resources. There are a lot of mining companies and it is known not just in the Philippines, but also uh, in other countries like in Asia, like a lot of mining companies are uh, really uh, do their investments in the region. So there are actually a lot of mining tenements. No? For example, this is the map of Karaga region. And uh, those uh, colored map, colored parts of the map, like this one, the red maps and the green and the light green, those uh, areas have uh, operating, operating mining operations and others are just waiting for their permit to be granted by the government. And aside from the metallic mines, the government is also offering uh, coal areas no, for mining of coal or carbon. No? And it is all over Mindanao. And of course, uh, these, these areas that are being mined and being offered for mining are actually areas of indigenous peoples. No? So for example, this one, the government, the Department of Energy, has given uh, coal operating contracts to a lot of companies 
who wished to operate in the ancestral domain of the indigenous peoples. So for example, this is the effect of mining in one of the provinces in Surigao del Norte. Uh, the, the previous home of the Mamanua indigenous tribe, it became a mining site. So as you can see, you know, the trees are cut down, the mountains are already denuded, the, the water is already orangey. So it's not really healthy ecosystem anymore. And the people living there, the indigenous people living there have been driven away. You know? So right now, uh, if you go to Mindanao, you can really see a lot of indigenous people uh, begging in the streets because they have no more uh, source of livelihood, source of food anymore because their uh, homes were converted into mining companies. So this one, for example, uh, this is the data from the from the government. Uh, the mining companies uh, shell out so many, so much money from uh, these lands. No? Uh, for example, by nickel alone, they get uh, 14 billion pesos. That's, that's uh, a huge amount. Like, I don't know how to convert, but it's, I guess, one dollar is, one US dollar is about 50 pesos. So it, it, it costs about uh, millions of US dollars. No? Uh, the government is making so much money. The mining companies are making so much money. No? So, and most especially these mining companies are foreign mining companies. These are not owned by the Filipinos. These are not owned by the Philippines. No, so most of this money just go directly to uh, foreign mining companies and the government. No, so it's actually very uh, ironic because the government claims that mining operations bring wealth and development to the Philippines, to the Caraga region. It brings wealth to the Philippines, no. But when we when we look at the data from the government again, uh, since the Caraga region is raking so much money from mining, it's actually very unfortunate that this does not translate to uh, development in the grassroots. People are still living in poverty. In fact. Caraga region is the number two uh, poorest region in the whole of the Philippines out of around 17 regions, out of 17 or 20 regions in the Philippines. It's the number two poorest region. No? And there are about 1 million uh, poor population in Caraga region. So the indigenous people in Caraga region, it it's about 500,000 no, individuals. So you can see there's, it really affects, no, mining really affects the whole of Caraga and especially the Lumad people. Since 21% of the total population of the Lumad, uh, they comprise, 21% uh, of the total population in Caraga no, are comprised of Lumad people. So, uh, so here we're going to discuss what is a lumad. No? So lumad is a, actually a native word for native. No? It's a local word for native, basically indigenous. No? So it's a collective term of all the indigenous peoples uh, in Mindanao of Southern Philippines. No? There are about 18 ethnolinguistic groups in Mindanao. And five of these are in Caraga. So these are the Manoba tribe. Banuaon, Higaonon, Mamanua, and Talandig. So here we can see the ancestral domain or ancestral lands no, of the 
Lumad in Mindanao. These are the pictures we took. So uh, if we have uh, a short historical background, you know, how the Lumad people are being brought here by being brought into the ancestral lands, it's because uh, during the Spanish colonization, during the uh, 1500s, no, that the Spain colonized the Philippines and those Filipinos, those natives who resisted Spanish colonization, they went up to the mountains uh, to preserve their culture, to preserve their way of life, their way of uh, leadership, their systems. So they, they, they hid into the mountains so that uh, they can uh, live peacefully away from the colonizers. So uh, that's why the indigenous peoples now are still, their culture is still intact, their way of life, their politics. No? And their lands now are still very rich. No? It's still uh, protected because uh, the indigenous people continue to uh, protect their life. No? They're still using medis uh, medicinal herbs. No? to treat their sicknesses, their illnesses, and they have really very rich knowledge you know, on how to, how to uh, treat uh, sick people with uh, just using leaves and roots and whatever part of the plants. You know? And for example, this one, this is the coal or the carbon you know, that people see in their communities. So, even by just walking into the, the in their roads, like you will really see a lot of uh, minerals no, coming out from the earth. And they say that if you dig deeper down, uh, you can you can uh, find more uh, minerals that are way more expensive. No? So that's why the mining companies are really. Uh, drooling no, just to get into these ancestral domains. So there are a lot of fruits, uh, food no, that are that basically feed the community. No. So that is the ancestral lands. No. Uh, basically the ancestral lands it is found in the heart of the forest no. and it is really far from the mainstream society like you'd have to walk uh, or, or ride a motorcycle for about an hour or two. In other communities, they have to walk around like three days just to get into the indigenous communities. So that's really far. And because it's far, no, there are no social services. The government cannot reach those areas. Uh, and since the government cannot provide, uh, so, since it's unreachable, the government uh, have difficulties in providing social services like education. Uh, there are no schools in these areas. No, there are no hospitals, no uh, development projects for these areas, and because of that, uh, discrimination. No? It's really giving. Uh, it's giving, uh, because of the illiteracy of the people, no, it's, there's more discrimination among the indigenous peoples, among the Lumad people. And because of the illiteracy, it is usually being uh, exploited by the mining companies, no, by the logging companies. For example, uh, companies go to the communities and they make them sign paper, which the communities don't know how to read or how to uh, write. No? So the companies will just ask them to put their thumb mark and that's it. No? They're actually already giving consent to mine their areas. So that's how uh, land grabbing works no? because the Luma people uh, still do not know how to read and write. That is why one of the one of the solution, no? uh, since uh, land grabbing persisted, no? 
land grabbing was so rampant in 1970s, 1980s, uh, the Lumad people organized themselves. No? They started to organize, build organizations. And one of the solutions that these organizations have pushed forward is to create their own school system. No? So Lumad communities actually built uh, their own schools no? because they want to educate their people, their youth, their children, so that they can defend their ancestral lands. So, uh, yeah. Uh, Lumad schools are built uh, with the help of uh, a lot of organizations, but basically they are built by the community. So, and held by the church people, by different NGOs, by different progressive groups. No? So the purpose of these Lumad schools is to create a uh, self-reliant and self-sufficient Lumad communities. So uh, self-sufficient, it means that the community can no longer need no, outside food, like they no longer need uh, to buy food from the market. They just steal their lands and make uh, them productive no, and harvest food since uh, that's how the Lumad communities uh, long before have existed. No? Self-reliant so that they can teach their own uh, their own tribe, no, their own community. They can manage their own uh, life. No, they have uh, the self determination. Yeah. So since uh, since the main livelihood of the Lumad people is farming or agriculture, uh, the Lumad schools are primarily teaching agriculture to students. So. We have a scientific and sustainable agriculture no, to actually uh, progress no, from the old methods of farming. Because, for example, in the community, before they burn the trees, they, bore, they, they burn the uh, woods no, to clear out the lands. But now, uh, the through the health of science, no, people are actually learning that it's a bad practice. No? So uh, it's not a, actually good for the soil and for the environment. So uh, that's one example no, of how uh, scientific farming have, have uh, helped the community you know, develop their ways. And the other one is to uh, preserve the land. No? And free it from the corporate way of farming wherein you have to uh, put pesticide and other uh, non-organic no? non uh, chemicals that are being used uh, in the farms no? which, is, which actually damages the land which actually damages the crops no? and so why are we doing the scientific and sustainable agriculture? Because uh, farming is, we want farming no, to be sustainable, not just we want to get food, not just for ourselves, not just for this generation, but for the next generations to come. No, so uh, according to the elders, no, we, we do not want to just uh, get food from the land no we also have to feed the land no so by providing them like organic filter fertilizer and providing love and care to the land so agriculture this is for example the curriculum design no of alkadev no since the uh, agriculture is the core of the curriculum and other subjects no, are being intertwined with the with the core subject. No? So, for example, in English, uh, we study about how how to like 
express ourselves in English, like this one. You know, how do we? How do we? Uh, write no, the processes that we do in farming so that other people can learn from it like that. In science, we study about uh, the chemicals that can be good or that can be bad for the land, no? which, which uh, plants can uh, help deter the pests eating the plants or in math for example we calculate the land area how do we maximize the harvest or how do we uh, measure uh, the plots in the farm like that so uh, most of the subjects are uh, integrated to agriculture so, for example, in the actually, uh, since we are in an agricultural school, no, uh, students have to go to the farm 5 a.m. So, 5 in the morning, students are already awake and they go to the farm and do uh, their farm work 5 to 7 a.m. No? But there's no problem about going to school early since the students are living in a dormitory. And that's it. Uh, when after harvesting the food, you know, we divide them to the dormitories and we, the students cook it by themselves you know, because it's one, it's the, it's one objective of al you no, know, to make, uh, to create students who are self-reliant, and stand by themselves, no, who can cook food for themselves, no. So at an early age, twelve or thirteen, students in Al Qadev are already very responsible. They know how to cook. They know how to uh, uh, prepare for themselves to school, and with the help of the their schoolmates. Okay, and. Aside from teaching the students about agriculture, uh, Lumad schools are also providing trainings and uh, livelihood programs to the community themselves. Now, for example, uh, their, the Lumad schools provide like training on how to uh, do sustainable agriculture and give out like materials that are needed for uh, advanced technology. In farming so that's why communities now have a lot more harvest no, than before no. they're already planting more agricultural plants no, and like fruit bearing trees etc so the land can be more productive and aside from teaching agriculture no, the lumad schools uh, they are uh, the bastions of culture. No? So, since there are a lot of really cultural attacks no, from like the global, the Western world, no? uh, cultural attacks. And so the Lumad schools help in protecting the Lumad culture no? so that uh, this culture can still be practiced in their communities because uh, there are a lot of influences really that uh, kill this culture and but and also according to the koan to the leaders and the elders uh, their organization they say that it's really our role to not just protect the culture but also not just preserve the culture but also to develop the culture uh, they mean not just preserve because when they say preserve like you treat culture like a static object no so when you protect or when you preserve the culture it's like also preserving the harmful practices no like for example uh 
like for example the harmful practices of having uh, multiple multiple wives or for multiple wives no by the elders so they're trying to remove uh, some parts also of their culture no they say to develop this uh, to develop the culture that is responsive to uh, the society now no and for example in the because in rural communities in the philippines uh, there's really uh, a lot of patriarchy uh, misogyny no uh, women are not included in the production they are not given uh, much value no? so in lumad schools this uh, the women the the girls the children uh, we really teach them no, that women have place in production women have place in the society so that's why uh, that's why uh, in the community after they graduate no, uh, women become leaders of their community already no? so women have become empowered because of the lumad schools and because of the lumad organization that is uh, actively combating no, the uh, harmful uh, practices and culture and for example also this one is a ritual it's a ritual for a same-sex marriage in the tribe no? so because the lumad schools have been teaching about uh, about gender equality you know? so students and the youth no have become more expressive about their sexual identity about their sexual orientation and this is a particular achievement in the community you know, because it really went to a lot of struggle you know, because at first the community was they were homophobic they were uh, not in favor you know, of having same-sex relationships but after struggling, after educating the people, uh, love won in the community. No? So that's it. Uh, also, uh, Lumad schools teach about the ancestral domain, teach about the rights of the students, of the children, no? about the community. No? So we are teaching how to defend their human rights, now, what are the most common human rights violations and how do we protect them? No? How do we stand up against them? And of course, no, uh, since, since the Lumad communities are always uh, marginalized, are always attacked, are always being killed, no? land grabbing, so that's why... Uh, through the LUMAD organizations and the LUMAD schools, no, the students uh, learn also not just how to study their rights, but also how to uh, fight for their rights. So that's why students, for example, they in even in school, no, they really have re they really practice how to voice out uh, their opinions. They are being taught critical thinking. They are being taught. Uh, how to uh, effectively uh, push for an alternative. So that's it. No? So because no, the LUMAD schools and the communities are fighting against the mining companies, against these companies who wish to grab their lands, no? because the Lumad people have been defending themselves, they're also being attacked no? by the state forces, by the government forces, just to force them to give up their lands. So for example, here's a timeline of our uh, Lumad school. No? So Al-Kadev in 2004, it was founded. No? And just uh, years later, uh, there were a lot of killings, 
there were a lot of forcible occupation of soldiers in the community and uh, Lumad people have to evacuate their place for several times no? just because there were a lot of soldiers who were harassing uh, the community, the children, the women, no? and there were a lot of killings. And one of the worst incidents happened in September 1, 2015. It was called the Lianga Massacre. So what happened here is that the government forces, the soldiers, uh, they occupied the community days before the incident. And on September 1, uh, the paramilitary group, no, a paramilitary group went to the community. They knocked into the houses. They gathered the people in a basketball court in the community. And they killed the leader, the leaders in front of everyone. So that's how brutal it gets. So three of the leaders were killed by the government forces and their paramilitary groups. So they were Sir Emoxa Marka. He was a he was the executive director of Al Qadev, uh, Dato Belusen. So he's a chieftain of the tribe, and Junel Campos. He is the organizational chairperson of the Lumad organization. So these three were killed. And one of the most striking statements no, the, the armed forces said to the Lumad communities that if you only allowed mining companies to enter here, this would not have happened to you. No, so just for defending themselves against mining companies, the Lumad leaders were killed. And so that, that happened in 2015. No? And in 2017, uh, if you are familiar, of course, with Rodrigo Duterte. So Duterte also came from southern Philippines, from Mindanao. And people actually thought that Duterte would protect the indigenous peoples no? because he even promised before that he would end uh, militarization in Lumad areas. And in fact, uh, before he became president, uh, there were a lot of partnerships with the president, uh, with Duterte, about uh, giving Lumad people uh, development projects. But when he became president, no, uh, he really became a monster. And the primary victims of his monstrousness were the Lumad indigenous people. No? So he declared martial law in Mindanao. And the martial law, it was first targeted in Marawi City. There was a city in Mindanao where there were uh, suspected terrorists. No? But he extended the implementation of martial law to whole of Mindanao. And he targeted especially the indigenous communities in Mindanao. So there were a lot of human rights violations here that are listed, like for example, harassment by the soldiers. Uh, people are forced to evacuate their communities. No? And when they are in their evacuation centers, people are being denied of humanitarian access. No? They are also forced to surrender as rebels, as armed rebels. And there were a lot of schools that were shut down during martial law. So the Lumad schools that were built were shut down by the government. No? And there were a lot of trump up charges. No? The leaders, the leaders who were defending themselves, their organizations, they are filed with uh, charges. No? That's make that makes them criminal, and a lot of leaders were also arrested during this time. They were imprisoned, you know, and thrown to jail. There were also cases that uh, soldiers you know, encamped in schools. And so this one, for example, this is when we evacuated 
after there were uh, soldiers uh, harassing and intimidating the community. So we were forced to leave the community just to seek safety in an another area, just so we can avoid the soldiers that are wreaking havoc in the community. So since uh, there were a lot of communities now that have to uh, go to the evacuation center, so students now are also for forced to learn in the evacuation camp. No? So it's no longer it's no longer uh, fit for learning. No? That's why students have hard time learning already. And for example, this is one, the soldiers were harassing no? the humanitarian workers who wish to bring donations to the community. There were a lot, there were more, a lot of uh, violations. For example, uh, there were killings and other killings, no? and sexual harassment of women and children, indiscriminate fighting, no? the, the soldiers go uh, shooting rampage, no? just shooting random uh, houses and shooting random people, and aerial bombardment. No? So most of these. Uh, most of the military uh, equipment were funded by the U.S. government. And there were also frustrated killings. And even after the Duterte declared martial law, he also threatened to bomb Blue Mud schools. So this is, this is when... Uh, tension between the Duterte government and the Lumad schools escalated. No? So he started threatening the Lumad schools and they started like attacking Lumad schools in every uh, different forms that they knew. So Duterte likes to link no? the Lumad schools to the communist rebels no? just so he can justify the Lumad schools to be closed down. So like Duterte says that, the Duterte and the armed forces are saying that the Lumad schools are training ground for armed rebels when in fact, uh, they just want to destroy these Lumad schools because they are protecting the environment, the ancestral domain. And also Duterte also uh, publicly announced no, that he wished to choose investors himself to develop Lumad lands for oil, palm, and mining because he says that it's a waste of resources if we do not maximize the oil, palm, and the minerals that are found in the ancestral domain. So Duterte says that we should uh, make this ancestral domain productive no so we we have to choose investors and that's uh that time no the attacks in lumad communities really uh, escalated also and just recently if we have heard about the anti-terrorism law so it was a law that was passed recently in the philippines uh, which uh, they say uh, is an anti-terrorism law, but in fact, it's just a state terrorism law which targets human rights defenders, the land rights defenders, the environmental defenders, no? Because Duterte wants to tag everyone as terrorists, no? If you fight for human rights, then you are a terrorist. If you are uh, fighting for your ancestral domain, you are a terrorist. So if you are a terrorist, then you can be you can be arrested, you can be killed. No? So that's uh, what is called terrorist tagging. And the victims here, usually the human rights advocates, and for our context, the Lumad schools, the teachers, the leaders are being tagged as terrorists. So that's the first step of what they are doing. 
the second step is filing of trump up charges now they are uh, they file charges against the lumad leaders teachers the advocates and the peasant leaders basically these are the land rights defenders you no know, because there are a lot of mining companies who wish to grab lands so they are filed with different criminal charges and after that one there are the pictures of our leaders of our co-teachers they are being uh, put no, in different places in public areas that they are wanted persons no, that they are criminals so that's how they vilify the uh, indigenous peoples how they criminalize the land rights defenders and just this quarantine period uh, during the pandemic one of the leaders this one uh, in the middle it's Gloria Mom, Bae Gloria Tomalon. She is a community leader also, and she was arrested in March 17. So that's uh, really a violation of human rights. So this 2020, it, it's like a, it's really like a repeat of what happened in 2015. There were a lot of soldiers in the community. This one, no, and even as we speak now, there are a lot of soldiers in the different communities in Lumad areas. Now, they are forcing the people to give up the fight for their lands. Now, they are forcing the people to uh, not join organizations anymore. They are, they are looking for the teachers of the Lumad schools because they want to close down the Lumad schools. Now. And in fact, they did not allow the Lumad schools to operate again. So they, they are destroying, literally, the Lumad schools. They are locking them up. They are, they are forcing the parents not to enroll their children anymore to the Lumad schools. So there's really a lot of terrorism done by the government forces here. And even last week, no, one of our one of our students called up, called us up, and they said that the soldiers just randomly shot, uh, shoot in their house, no, and they were almost hit by the bullets, no, from the soldiers. So it's really a difficult time for the Lumad people now especially that we are facing a global crisis the pandemic and the financial crisis so uh, the Lumad people a lot of them are seeking refuge in different areas no? so they are really uh, they're really struggling no? with their day-to-day -day needs and uh, they are seeking for safety elsewhere some are hid hiding in the caves in the forest, in others go to uh, their relatives in the different parts of the country just so they can escape the terrorism of the government forces. So, and in whole, in total, no, there, are, there are around 178 Lumad schools that are closed down under the Duterte regime. Those schools that were built by the community themselves they were closed down by the government who never actually who never helped in building those schools and around one around 5500 students now have lost access to the quality education that these lumad schools are providing so that's why the uh, Lumad people, no, they are struggling really harder this time to save the Andap Valley complex, the, the ancestral lands. No, they say no to mining. And the youth especially, who they're leading the struggle to... Uh, voice out no, to express uh, their 
uh, fight for their education that their schools will be opened up again that the government na stop mining operations in the ancestral domain so i guess that's all na. and so for this part maybe i'll just share some ways on how we can help the lumad communities so So ayun, maybe we can amplify the we can share the stories of the Lumad people no? and we can read up more about them. I'll just post the links here in the chat box. And also we can donate, no? especially now that the Lumad people are really uh, struggling with their day-to-day -day needs. Uh, it would really help if uh, we get uh, financial support if you can give them financial support for their daily meals actually one dollar really costs a lot in the philippines that can already feed one dollar already uh, can feed a lot of uh, lumad children so we can create our own fundra fundraisers etc so here are the links and the drive uh, I have compiled the links no? so we can share the Facebook pages and the PayPal link. And I have also put a, a drive here. So those who wish to study more about the situation of the Lumad people, you can check this Google Drive link. Uh, there's a really good references there. So if you want to do research uh, you can help so and you can also contact me if you wish to uh, coordinate uh, with different projects so i guess that's all no? uh, the struggle of the lumad is really centered on the struggle for their ancestral domain for their uh, ancestral lands and for their fight for the right to education no it's really an inspiring uh inspiring story no that's why i volunteered in the lumad schools because i was uh inspired by how the lumad people fought for their rights fought for their lands and even built their own schools because the government has systematically uh, marginalized them, has systematically uh, neglected them, and it's uh, inspiring how they collectively uh, fought for their own rights. That's why it's also uh, a challenge for us, those in the uh, comfortable, you know, in the privileged classes, that maybe uh, we can extend our solidarity, we can extend our help no, to those who are being silenced to those who are being killed by this uh, society so that's is why the call for us it is to fight and be not afraid so in filipino it's makibaka wag matakot and that's all thank you so much for listening and i hope you all learned a lot from uh, the discussion today and if you have more questions just type in the just type to the chat box all right thanks so much chad chad i don't know if you can see that in the text box but, oh, yes, yes. Uh, jessica has a question as to uh how long did it take to launch the lumad schools and how long have they been in operation so the lumad schools were built after the organizations were built. So, for example, the in our case, the Lumad's the Lumad organization was built in the 80s, no? and around that time also the Lumad schools were established. And at first, it it wasn't in a formal setting like in the building. At first, the Lumad schools were 
uh, basically in the community, in the houses of the Lumad people, you know, there are uh, informal teachers. They just uh, started teaching then until it became more systematic that uh, the community has to build uh, structures or building. You know. So as years go on, it's uh, it has become more structured. So in our in our region, the Lumad School started in 1980s. You know, so it has been operating for around 90s, 2000s, 10s, around four decades, three decades. You no, know? although Al Kadav Lumad School, uh, it has been for around 16 or 17 years since it was uh, built. You no, know, the high school. It was. It was a high school the Lumad school, so the Al-Kadev, and the primary school was called TRIPS, Tribal Filipino Program. So uh, the Lumad schools were built you know, because of the need of the community. It's the community who requests that we should build this one, we should start. Uh, and in fact, in other areas, in other uh, parts of Mindanao, there have been initiatives to build a college for the Lumad also, but it, it, has, it was also closed, but the, closed down by the government. So it's really a sad story. But it's, the struggle is ongoing. Chad, you know, I understand there's also similar struggles going on in Negros uh, in uh, another part of the Philippines, a little bit more north. Is there any sort of solidarity between the communities? Some of the agricultural work that's going on in Negros, the attacks that are happening in Negros, and the attacks that are happening in uh, Mindanao. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, since the since the Lumad schools are really <clears throat> and the Lumad organizations now are uh, fighting not just for their community, they're also fighting for the rights of especially their fellow farmers. No, there are a lot, there, there are a lot of uh, movement, for example, you know, where uh, we call for the rights of the peasants, of the farmers in, in Negros. And uh, we are also teaching the current events no, in the Philippines about the, what's happening and the farmers. And there are also instances where Lumad people are able to meet with farmers from the different uh, parts of the Philippines to learn from each other, to uh, to share their experiences and also their practices in agriculture. Okay, other questions? Well, while we wait, maybe I'll just <laughs> ask you one more question. And it's sort of a sensitive question because I, I know that the that President Duterte uh, tries to make a link between the NPA or the communist rebels and the, the Lumad communities, especially in Mindanao. Do you have any support from any of the activist groups? Uh, maybe it's a too sensitive a question, I'm not sure, but do you get support uh, from activist groups in Mindanao? Do you find that there's support, we could say left-wing support or uh, uh, anything that uh, I don't know to, to 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 sort of back the struggle of the Lumal. Hmm. Uh, I would like to historicize that question because yes. actually the Lumad, the term Lumad, uh, how it came to be, it was because of the uh, struggle of the indigenous people along with the activist groups. No? along with the progressive groups and the church groups. That's why the Lumad term came to be. You know? So since time immemorial, the Lumad people who have been struggling for their rights along with the activists, you know, there's really uh, a solidarity uh, between them. That's why, uh, and even before, even before the communist rebels were uh, established no, before the N the NPA was established. There was already uh, coordination between the activist groups and the uh, the church groups and the uh, Lumad people. If 
fighting for their ancestral domains. Okay. There's a question from Kezaya. Um, has there been any contact with the UN for help regarding uh, uh, what the government has been doing? Yes, yes. Uh, we are our network, the Save Wild Schools network. No, we have been filing reports to the UN, and along with the human rights organizations, we've been updating the uh, different uh, special rapporteur of UN. No, so, uh, but it's just up to that level. We're just making them aware that this is happening, and of course, uh, there's. Uh, about the action plan, there's not much uh, action aside from investigation, I guess. There's not much action that is uh, felt by the community, especially that Duterte is really a uh, fascist dictator. No? So Duterte even wants to shut uh, ties with the United Nations just because uh, Sometimes the UN would side with the Filipino people. Jessica also is following up on that question with just maybe a more broader sense of international support. What is the international support uh, or even the coverage of the struggles happening for the, uh, the IP in, in Mindanao or in the Philippines in general? Yeah, yes, uh, there actually, there were actually, uh, there's actually a international support no, for the indigenous peoples. Uh, there is the indigenous peoples movement for self-determination and liberation. It's a, it's a international network of indigenous peoples. Then there's also a uh, during 2015 or 2016, there were a lot of uh, educational tours, no? uh, LUMAD leaders from all over, from Mindanao and indigenous leaders from all over the Philippines. They went to Canada and the United States no? to uh, do a speaking engagement with different institutions like that. So there was a, there's also a global network called Liang Network. It's for uh, it's a global network for Lumad women. No? So if you wish to connect with them, you can just contact me if ever. So and there's a there's a international support and. In fact, uh, a lot of uh, the Lumad schools are supported by uh, international uh, bodies. For example, Al Kadev was once supported by the Embassy of Belgium. Mm. So, and uh, and other e European uh, or organizations. Okay, any more questions? If not, I guess we can uh, we could thank Chad again for his presentation, and um, thanks everyone for coming. And uh, we'll see you at more of the conferences uh, as they happen this week. Thanks so much, Chad. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for coming. Bye. Thank you, Jessica, for the questions too. Bye bye. Kimberly Gulcha. I, I have a quick. I have from a, Cebu, just, uh, I have a quick question to ask uh, just before uh, we uh, we end. Uh, are are you are you okay? Like your situation? Like are you safe? Uh, I am you're... actually also being. I am also being tagged as a terrorist. No, so oh. the there are a lot of uh, social media posts against me. Uh, the police like posting my pictures on social media and they're like I, I receive a lot of death threats just because I am exposing what they are doing to the indigenous peoples okay well uh, be safe <laughs> thank you so much I hope to see you soon <laughs>
Hey, Chad, has the, have the communities been particularly affected by COVID more so than, say, the rest of the Philippines? Or not necessarily? Uh, mm, there's not much effect uh, in of COVID. No? Okay. Although the, uh, the presence of the military, because the military like goes yeah. in and out, that yeah. really brings a higher risk of First. infection. Ok, I don't know, est-ce que moi je juste, je, je termine le, la réunion là, c'est ça? Thank you, uh, Chad. Thank you so much. Chad, Kim Gultia, who was here, I don't know if she's still here, is from Cebu also. Oh, we, we, are, we have a colleague named Gultia in Al-Kadev. <laughs> ah, really? Hi, I'm here. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Hi. Um, Gulcha is my um, husband's name. So, um, but but my, my husband's from Mindanao. Oh, uh, yes, yes. <laughs> oh, really? What's his name? Uh, Al Kadev? Uh, it's Don Don Gulcha. <laughs> Don 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 Gulcha. I should ask my husband. I didn't, I don't know. I didn't know Surigao. that. Sasurigao. Yes. So, Bisaya, kachad. Uh oh. Ah, okay. Oh, um, bisaya, lantar kay kay bang minisi, kung bisaya. <laughs> Sige. So, yeah. Chad, thank you so much for for your lecture. It was um, it just it was very informative. Um, thank you for sharing. Um, in, coming from the Philippines, I didn't even know. I didn't even know that these things were happening. So, um, I think we, I, I admire you for for sharing your work. Um, it's, it's, this is something that we all should know. I mean, not just us here in, in, in Canada, and not just Filipinos in Canada, but, but um, um, Filipinos from, from everywhere, from around the world, from everywhere, and especially in the Philippines. So we need, and also we need to be taught, um, you know, about, about Luban communities. I mean, I was, I was um, uh, raised and educated in the Philippines, and yet um, I really know very little about Luban communities. In indigenous communities, it's a shame. So it's I don't have a question; it's just a comment. Thank you so much. Okay, bah moi je vais terminer la meeting là, ouais. et puis euh, bah tu dois aller à, au, je sais pas c'est la, la prochaine là, mais euh, merci tout le monde. Thanks everybody. Bye merci. chat. Thanks so much. Let's maybe we can talk uh, later at some point. Merci.